Hey, how's it going? Uh, for someone who doesn't play a whole lot of video games, I, I sure do have a, a channel about playing video games. Um, mainly because school uh, keeps me so busy that I just, I, I don't get around to playing them and much less have time to talk about them on this channel. But I miss doing that. So, uh, to fix that in the year 2019, I have decided, hey, how about I talk about each game that I played this year for a minute. So in absolutely no order in particular, uh, here we go. So before we get started, I have an honorable mention for a game I have never played and do not intend to ever play. Uh, I have watched way, way too many hours of Mario Maker 2 because creative games really stress me out. These days, like, after a long day of work, coming home and sitting down and then playing a game that also feels like work, that's just not appealing to me. It's not engaging in the same way that it was when I was like 10 and I could play Minecraft and My Sims. Like I have different outlets for my creativity and I think I get more out of watching other people play Mario Maker than I would if I were playing it. I like games that have checkboxes where I can just take them off one by one and say I'm done, is finished, I can put this game on the shelf and never look at it. And the great thing about this game is that it removes the barrier for entry that I think modding has like had for years so if more people have access to tools like this more people can make more cool levels and that's like objectively a good thing uh, so with that being said here are four channels I've been watching to death lately uh, you can check them out in the description the RPG genre has always felt inaccessible to me and for the longest time I wasn't exactly sure why see I like Paper Mario I love Fire Emblem but it wasn't until Into the Breach that I realized that time investment is the major barrier for me. Into the Breach has battles that last on average 5 to 6 turns, on maps no bigger than 8x8 eight eight tiles. There's no 6 hour tutorial, there's no cutscene heavy prologue, you're meant to blast through these intense sci-fi chess matches, where the goal isn't to wipe out the enemy, so much as to prevent total annihilation of your side. You always see the enemy's moves one turn in advance, so it's often a better strategy to push enemies around rather than attack them directly, using the terrain to halt their reproduction and redirect their attacks to each other. If you die, you can usually send one character back in time with all their upgrades, but by no means can you exploit this to beat the game. If you aren't playing smarter, you're never gonna win. If the genre has felt impossible to get into in the past, this may be a good entry point. Super Mario 3D World is a great game. I love it. But its biggest drawback is repeatedly getting stopped and told, I haven't collected enough green stars to move on. And replaying levels that are upwards of 10 minutes each just to get one last green star isn't exactly motivating. Now Captain Toad Treasure Tracker, even though it has a similar system of three hidden collectibles per level, it never reaches the same level of frustration. The stages are so short and dense that the hidden gems feel like an essential part of the experience and not a tacked on scavenger hunt. Captain Toad's pacing is rock solid, and it constantly cycles its mechanics every stage so that you never get bored of any one thing. And if you're ever trying to get someone into video games for the first time, this would be a good place to start. I find new players often struggle with 3D environments, like rotating the camera at the same time as moving their character, and this game is great for learning how to do that. And since the captain here can't jump, challenges are more based on spatial awareness than reflexes. I'd argue it's better to start people off with this game than with Mario. A lot of my weirdest purchases are games from the discount page on the eShop, where I'm trying to use up my leftover funds from a big purchase. That's how I wound up with Refunct, a game that resembles someone's test demo from, you know, a game jam, more than an actual game. It's a serene experience where you swim around in a sea filled with sunken platforms, and as you press glowing red buttons, more platforms rise from the depths. It's a first-person platformer, which is an odd choice, since it's hard to tell where you are relative to platforms. Wall jumping, in particular, takes some getting used to, but the lack of health or timer means there's little reason to get frustrated. Every time you touch a new platform, you change its color, so there's even a neat little side objective to aim for. I beat it the first time in an hour, and the second time in 20 minutes, so, you know, don't expect a lot of content, but I've paid more money for worse experiences, so I'm not really going to complain. It's nice to be pleasantly surprised by the bargain bin for once. So almost four years ago, The Force Awakens was premiering in theaters, and spoiler culture went from an occasional annoyance to a weaponized phenomenon. Back when Game of Thrones was airing, you couldn't even load Twitter without the trending tab spoiling half the episode for you. And that's just how entertainment works now, I guess. Either you go to the trouble of unfollowing or muting keywords online, or you just accept that unless you plan your schedule around media consumption, you're probably going to get spoiled. 
Most of the games in this video are not recent releases. Even Untitled Goose Game, which I played only two weeks after launch, got spoiled for me by GIFs and fan art on Twitter. And you might ask, well, okay, how do you get spoiled on a comedy game? But it's like, if I go to a comedy show and I know the punchlines ahead of time, like, I'm gonna get a little bit more out of it seeing them delivered live, but you know, I wish I could have gone in blind. Regardless, it's one of the best games of this year, you'd be missing out if you didn't give it a try. By this point, most of you have probably heard about Baba Is You. Uh, it's one of the most innovative puzzle games ever made, and I expect it'll be thought of in the same way as Portal, which uh, similarly challenged our preconceptions of the genre. You and your cute little sheep guy move blocks around to literally change the rules of the game on the fly. Walls in the way? Walls don't matter now. Lava blocking your path? You are the lava. Absolutely just brilliant stuff. I just don't really find it all that fun. The premise and the mechanics are genius. Uh, but I don't know man, something about it didn't connect with me. I kept getting stuck on puzzles only to look up the answer and realize I had most of it figured out, but I was standing one space too low or I had the blocks like misaligned in some small way. Like I'd already had the key aha moment about the rule sets, but got hung up on the specifics of the block placements. Baba deserves all the attention it's getting, but it's just not for me. Gris is one of those games where even just showing you footage of later levels would probably be a spoiler. Gris doesn't have an explicit narrative, there's no dialogue, but there's very much like a story. That story is told through gameplay, but to a larger extent the art, and in particular the inclusion or even lack of color. Any still image of Gris would be like a, a great desktop background because there's a very intentional framing to everything and like the color contrast is very carefully chosen. Certain levels remind me a lot of backgrounds from like old Cartoon Network shows, actually. Uh, it's not a guarantee you'll connect with Gris. It's a slow paced linear game with stripped down mechanics. And a lot of people that's just not what they're looking for. Like I get that. But in my opinion, it's the perfect length for what it's trying to do. It doesn't overstay its welcome and you won't need more than a few hours to experience it. So do yourself a favor and play one of the prettiest games of probably the last decade. Uh, you ever started playing a game and knew immediately that you didn't care for it, but out of pure spite, you felt like you had to finish it? For me, that game was Lines X. Uh, I got it for less than a dollar, so I don't know what I expected. The idea is you're plopped into a grid with pairs of colored dots. To win, you need to connect each pair of dots without crossing lines. The trick is that you need to fill in every square of the grid first, so planning your use of space is critical. After about 10 levels of this, you've learned all you need to know. Uh, the problem is there are 90 more levels, and the difficulty curve transforms into a uh, difficulty zigzag, meaning there isn't a difficulty curve. Either no one playtested any of these levels, or they were procedurally generated. Some levels I'll be stuck for half an hour, slowly rethinking my initial moves until I find like the one clever, unique solution, but then I'll blast through the next five stages on my first try. Honestly, I'm just kind of baffled by the whole experience. It didn't occur to me until recently that Smash was the only multiplayer game I had for my Switch. Uh, I love Smash, it's great, it's a classic, but anytime it gets suggested when you're hanging out with friends, it's like, it's like, I don't know, man, like, they're always the bunch who are super gung-ho and a little too good at Smash, and then the one guy who isn't but is still gonna play because it's better than not playing, and then also the one friend who just straight up doesn't like Smash and who ends up sitting on their phone for the night. This series has over 70 characters now, and that's absurd for anyone who didn't grow up with this series and wants to learn, it's absolute bonkers. I stopped playing a month after Ultimate released. I have none of the DLC. I don't even pay for online. That's why I bought Duck Game. With Duck Game, nobody is complaining about using half a Joy-Con. No one is confused about the rules. Everyone won't stop quacking. Everyone has fancy hats. The baseline slaps. Please register to vote. This one actually took me by surprise. Ori and the Blind Forest seems right up my alley on paper. It's a cinematic, gorgeous 2D platformer with a semi-open world and a progression system. This is like exactly my genre. But I barely got halfway through before I was just, I was fully burnt out. Ori is undeniably gorgeous. It's an intricate merging of 2D characters and like 3D environments. And it's honestly a miracle that something that looks this good is playable. But the problem with games like this is that they're always floaty, 
like hazards blend into the background and like all the cinematic sequences are great but they're so random that beating them comes down to memorization. Combat is a button mashing slog, there's a baffling checkpoint system which is like either way too easy to spam except when you run out of energy, and the upgrade tree is so inconsistent that half of them feel useless and the other half feel overpowered. I did beat it in the end, but I can't say that I'd recommend it unless you're like a, a huge fan of this genre. I might be missing something here, but this is, this is not what I expected. One minute before you die, one minute to beat the game. Take Majora's Mask and accelerate the clock, and you get... Minute. A simple but sweet adventure game where you solve puzzles, talk to wacky people, all while trying to solve the mystery of your cursed sword. All in one minute increments. If you removed the central mechanic, the time limit, the game would be so bare bones it wouldn't hold your attention. But the time limit forces you to plan your route, focus on one task at a time, build a mental map, and experiment until you find the next clue. Only in this game could a maze with one clear path be a challenge, because you're not fast enough to get to the end. Only in this game can you have an NPC who speaks so slowly that you die before their text box loads. Minute feels like a love letter to the old Flash games I used to play on Newgrounds, but taken to their full potential. You don't really have an excuse not to try it either. It does only take a minute to beat, after all. I don't need to explain to you what Cuphead is. Even from a single screenshot, it's abundantly clear what you're getting into. A beautifully hand-animated tribute to the 1930s, and a brutally difficult boss gauntlet. So as for me, I had to wait a couple years for the Switch port, and I got exactly what I expected. I think its biggest accomplishment by far is how one-to-one -one the controls are with your movements. Uh, jumps aren't floaty, there's no delay in your attacks, etc. And it pulls this off while also having like a top-notch visual clarity, like it's very clear what the hazards are because they don't blend into the environment. If I got hit by something, it's because I wasn't paying attention, not because I couldn't see it. That has typically been my main complaint with action-heavy games that have so much going on visually. Uh, personally, I think the art is so impressive that even just seeing a new phase of a really tough boss acts as its own reward. If you don't plan on ever getting a copy, please watch a boss compilation. Like, this much hard work should be seen by as many people as possible. Moonlighter is extremely easy to pitch to people. You work as a shopkeeper to fund your dream of dungeon crawling. Presentation-wise, this game checks all the boxes, with an endearing art style and the soundtrack still stuck in my head, one of the best of this year. Unfortunately, because the game tries to balance two completely different gameplay styles, shopkeeping and dungeon crawling, taken on their own, they feel underdeveloped, and the appeal is mainly because of the back-and-forth gameplay loop of selling treasure to afford better equipment. Early on, I bought a huge-ass sword and a bow, and never bothered to diversify. Like, why waste money on a new upgrade tree when I could just upgrade what works? And yeah, I'm sure if I sat down and like did the math, I could figure out the stock system and the vague pricing mechanics, and I could be making an extra 20% profit per day, but I could also not put in that effort and still make most of that money. Uh, so with all that in mind, please also take into consideration that Moonlighter is apparently my most played Switch game of 2019. There were two separate golf games I wanted to play this year that explicitly market themselves as golf games for people who don't like golf. Uh, what the Golf doesn't have a Switch port yet, so I'm just going to talk about Golf Peaks, which ended up being my favorite puzzle game of this year. Golf Peaks is an isometric tile-based game where you need to get the ball into a hole, but you have a limited number of movement cards to do that. Roll a certain number of spaces, jump a certain number of spaces, jump then roll those spaces, you, you get the idea. Very simple concept, but it has an excellent difficulty curve as it introduces new environmental hazards across 120 levels. This includes quicksand, slopes, water, conveyor belts, teleportation holes, you name it. I love this game because not once did I have to look up a solution. You can always slowly work backwards from the solution, eliminating certain cards along the way, so you always feel like you're making progress. I wish the music was more than a 10 second loop, but for $6, I'm not that upset. You ever played a game and thought, damn, that was a romp? Because The Tourist is a romp and a half. It is also a perfect case study of how important lighting is to your game, because good lighting can make any art style look gorgeous. So after playing a bunch of dark and just gloomy games, it was a nice change of pace to play a vacation simulator where you can go swimming take pictures, go rock climbing, and solve ancient riddles left behind in the ruins of an extraterrestrial civilization. I don't always need intricate lore and complex characters, 
Sometimes I just want to gather fruit so this man can save his failing ice cream business. Sometimes all I want to do is beat this guy's high scores in the arcade and bully him into giving me all his money. I was sold as soon as I saw this trailer. Look at this man. He's got a sick ass shirt. He's got a rad mustache. Not a phone in sight. Living in the moment.